Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. And good evening. Good to see you all back again. And let's just again pick up where we left off, Genesis chapter 6. Now, I know it seems like we're making precious little headway. I've had one person who has retired uh, complain that he was afraid he'd be dead and gone before we got halfway through. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, always remember that once we get through Genesis and Exodus, then we, we zip along pretty good. And uh, we'll be up to the New Testament before you know it. But I've always felt that, that Genesis and Exodus are so foundational to everything else that, that it bears taking the time necessary to get a, a good understanding of it. And then from then on, we'll be able to see history unfold rather rapidly. And uh, like I said, we'll beat the New Testament before we know it. But whatever, back to Genesis chapter 6. And you remember last week we were talking about the pitch that Noah was to build this ark of wood but he was to pitch it with the bitumen or the tar that was so prevalent in that area of the world. Now, I've had the question come up, so I'll anticipate it for you since we're limited in our time factor here in the studio. I've had the question come up, well, if there was such amazing technology equal to what we have today, there must have been shipyards. Why didn't Noah just go to a shipyard? Well, I'll tell you why Noah couldn't go to a shipyard. Because that isn't the way God wanted it done. God wanted this ark to be built clear out, I think, on, on dry land somewhere, far removed from water, so that it would seem all the more absurd to the unbelieving masses. And again, I like to just have you picture this, if you will. And I'm sure others have, have brought this to your mind, your preachers, your teachers, or whatever. But can you imagine the response of the people of Noah's day when this old gentleman is out there and no doubt he had to hire a lot of people. There were big timbers to be handled. But don't you suppose the people of that day just ridiculed this crazy old man building something that he says is going to float in water when there isn't water for miles and miles and he talks about a flood hadn't even rained an inch or two, let alone enough to cover everything. And so God had his purpose. On top of that, I think God wanted this to carry on for 120 years so that that generation would have ample time to wake up and realize that judgment was coming. So there are a lot of reasons. Uh, the technology, I think, yeah. I think Noah could have gone to a shipyard, and I think he could have made it of steel or whatever had he wanted to, but that wasn't the way God intended it to be done. And so he says, make it of gopher wood. Secondly, remember, God is going to have Noah build this thing that it can withstand tremendous forces sitting out there with no destination. All it's going to have to do is survive just so it doesn't sink, and it'll be there for over a year in the water. All right, then let's go on. Verse 15. And this is the fashion or the pattern which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Now, from what reading I've been able to do, there are two lengths to a cubit. The short cubit was what we would call 18 inches. But they also had what they called a long cubit, which could be as much as 24 or 25 inches. But I usually stick with the short cubit so we don't look like we are being extravagant or exaggerating. And so if we use the short cubit and it was to be 300 cubits long, I took the time before we started to just draw a rectangular on the board, 450 feet long by 75 feet wide, and it was to be 45 feet high from top to the bottom. Three stories, that'd be 15-foot ceilings. That's a pretty good-sized room, isn't it? 15-foot ceilings. Now, in order to bring this into perspective, we have to understand that not until the great battleships of World War II, in fact, they used them again in the Persian Gulf the last couple of weeks, the battleships Wisconsin and Iowa, and uh, I think there are one or two others, maybe the New Jersey, 
45,000 ton displacement. I'll never forget that figure. But see, those ships weren't even quite, if I remember correctly, quite 450 feet long. And yet up until that point in human history, that had been the biggest vessel men had constructed. Now, of course, our great oil tankers, the super tankers, are something a little bit longer than this. I think, Liesl, do you know, do they get up to about 600 feet? But they're huge. But other than that, the ark is by far the largest floating vessel that mankind has ever had any reason to, to understand. 450 feet long. Now, again, to help you picture that, a football field is 300 feet, not even counting to the goalposts. That's from goal to goal. And here we go another 150 feet beyond that. That's a pretty long box. And like I said, it must have implied the use of tremendous timbers, huge timbers. And so Noah and his three sons, even if they were obedient enough to help old dad, uh, they couldn't have done it alone. And in fact, I was reading another book uh, titled The Flood by uh, a man's name escapes me, uh, a Dr. Rayberger, I think, if I'm not mistaken. At least he was a professor of theology, theology, theology up at uh, Concordia University in St. Louis. And, and he makes the same statement that evidently Noah had to hire many, many outside people but he made a tremendous illustration that I had never even thought of myself, and I was impressed with it. He said, just think of all the men that helped Noah in the building of that ark, day in and day out. They labored with the sweat of their brow to help build that ark. But when the flood came, they were not inside, and they were lost. And then he made this allusion. He said, today... How many church members aren't working in the church? They are busy doing what they think is their duty, but they've never entered into salvation, and when judgment comes, they're not going to be in the ark, they're going to be out. And I had never really thought of it that way. Here were these men and these people that had helped Noah build the ark. They could have enjoyed the safety of it, but instead, they were all, like all the rest, they mocked this crazy old man building a boat, and it's never rained. Well, whatever. He goes on with his instructions in verse 16, and not only was it to be a big, square, rectangular box. Remember now, there are no open decks. There are not great openings or windows or anything like that. One window, and it's going to be in the center of the top, and I think the top was flat relatively so, and up in the top he was to make a window. It was to be a cubit. In other words, again, 18 inches by 18 inches. And then there was to be one door in the side of it, and only one door. And then there were to be first, second, and third stories. Now, I'm sure you've all read descriptions of how much space was in this vessel. All you have to do is, is just, just read some good articles on, on Noah's Ark, and I'm sure you can find them in any good library. But I read one illustration that, that certainly made an impression on me because I can remember when I was young, I used to ship cattle from Montana to Iowa in boxcars. And a boxcar is a pretty good-sized vehicle. This Ark, one person alluded to it, as having as much room as a thousand cattle cars. Now, we can't imagine that. A hundred car train is pretty big. In fact, the other night I just happened to see a coal train go by a hundred boxcars of coal, and that's a long, long train. But imagine a thousand of them, and that's how much room was in this ark. It's just beyond our comprehension. And for this reason, God wasn't limited by the space in the ark. Secondly, I like to remind people, nowhere in Scripture does it say that all these animals were mature. In other words, when Noah brought in a pair of elephants, there's nothing to say that they couldn't have been a couple of baby elephants because God wasn't in any hurry to have them reproduce within the next year after they're off the ark as long as there was a pair coming up. So I think we can also take this into account that no doubt a lot of these pairs of the larger animals probably came in real young and they wouldn't demand much space. 
nor did they demand an awful lot of feed. So there's a lot of ways to analyze this thing without doing any violence to Scripture or taking away any of the miraculousness of it, and yet I want people to believe that it happened just the way the book says it did. All right, let's go on. Verse 17, And now God says, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth, God says, shall die. Verse 18, But with thee, that is with Noah, I will establish my covenant. Now, I haven't said too much about covenants in these first six chapters, but when we get to chapter 12, I'm going to use the word until it almost drives you crazy. Because the covenant that we run across in Genesis chapter 12 is, again, so basic to understanding all the rest of Scripture that I'll just be harping on it and harping on it. But before we get there, get this understanding, a covenant is something that God makes with man, and it's not man making it with God. And so a covenant is without rescinding. It can never be changed. It can never be rescinded. Once God makes a covenant, it is secure. And there are many covenants throughout Scripture. One of them, of course, is the one that he's going to give to Noah, and we call it the Noahic covenant, and that is that God will never again destroy the earth with flood. And he used the rainbow as the sign of that covenant. And remember, God made the covenant, not Noah. And so we can rest assured that this earth will never be destroyed by a flood. Now, it will be destroyed by fire, but not by a flood. All right, let's go on then. Verse 18 again, And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, thy wife, thy sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh. Now that doesn't mean every species or every subspecies, but it means one of every of the major components of a species. Now we know there are all kinds of horses, for example. Uh, you've got the Shetland pony, and you've got the big draft horse, and you've got the race horse, and you've got the pleasure horse, you've got the quarter horse. Now those are all within the species of the horse. Now he didn't have to have every one of those represented, but there had to be one pair of horses. And from that pair, then of course, everything came from it after the flood. In the same way with all the other major species, there came a pair of each one, everything, into the ark. Now always remember, look at the cat family. How many cats aren't there all the way from the huge lion down to your little house pet? But they're still all cats. In the same way with many of the other things. So just remember that all of these various subspecies were not necessarily represented, but the major only. All right, go on then to verse 20. Fowls after their kind. Cattle, domestic animals, after their kind. Every creeping thing of the earth, after his kind, within that species, see? Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Now, I hope you don't read that too casually. Two of every sort shall, what does it say? What does that mean? They came to the ark from every direction. Now, what should that have done to the people of Noah's day? Well, it should have woke them up, shouldn't it? Hey, what in the world is going on? All these creatures are finding their way to a central spot on the planet. And they were coming to the ark. Now, that was providential. Noah didn't have to go out and trap them. Noah didn't have to go out and do anything to bring them in. They came under the providential act of God. Read on. Verse 21. And Noah was to take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Now that's in perfect accord with Genesis 1, you remember? What was the diet of both man and beast? Everything that grew naturally. The herbs, the fruits, and the grasses. That was Adam and Eve's diet and the humans, as well as all fowl and all animal. 
They all ate of things that grew naturally, and so all they had to have was one class of food brought into the ark, and it'd be enough for man and beast and fowl and everything else. Now verse 22, Noah again is obedient. He does just exactly what God tells him to do. Now, didn't he have every right to say, now, wait a minute, this is absurd. What in the world is the reason for all this? No, Noah says nothing of the sort. Noah takes God at his word and whatever God says to do, ridiculous as it may have seemed at the time, Noah did it. Now, we're in the same situation today. A lot of people look at some of the things I teach and they say, Les, that's ridiculous. I can't help it. It's what the book says. In fact, I was in a phone conversation this morning with a gentleman uh, clear on another part of the country, and uh, this happened to come up about standing on the Word of God. And I, I just said, well, look, I know there are some people, they, they won't believe anything unless their particular denomination or their particular church says that this is it. And I've run into people like this who will simply tell me, but less my church teaches that they are the final authority and that the Bible is secondary, that I can't comprehend it unless the church interprets it for me. Now, you show me that in Scripture. Well, he said, I guess it isn't there. And I said, I guess it isn't. Because the Bible constantly encourages us to what? Study. See, what does Paul write to Timothy? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And that is given to every individual believer. We don't have to wait for someone to interpret it for us. And that's why I'm always telling my class people, oh, you've been with me a long time, you know I've said it. Don't just hang on what I say. Don't go out and say, well, this is what Les says. That doesn't hold anything. But oh, if I can just teach you to be able to go out and tell people, this is what the Bible says. This is what God's Word says. I don't want any credit for any of it, but be able to say, this is what God's Word says. And that's what Noah did. He did what God said. All right, now I think we're ready to go into chapter 7. Verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou, and all thy house into the ark. Now again, watch that language. Analyze it. Where is God speaking from? In the ark. He is speaking from in the ark now. It's finished. It's ready. And from within the ark, God says, Come, Noah, into the ark. He doesn't say, Go, Noah, into the ark. He says, Come. You see what a difference that makes? Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, I like to make that emphasis that God was in the ark. Because when the floodwaters rage, I don't think that wooden box would have survived had not God himself been the gyroscope that maintained that equilibrium. Remember... When Jesus was here on earth, they were going across the little Sea of Galilee. And if you know the geographical setting of the Sea of Galilee, it's right at the foot of the Golan Heights, and it's a relatively shallow sea. And shallow water has a tendency that when the wind comes, what happens? It gets real rough in a hurry. Now, deep water isn't that easily shook up, but shallow water immediately will have tremendous waves. So Jesus and the disciples, you remember, are going across the Sea of Galilee in, uh, in a little ship, as King James called it, but I think it was more or less a boat. But I think it was a boat large enough that it had a deck and a, and a, and a lower level. But what happened as they were about halfway across the Sea of Galilee? Oh, a tremendous storm. And the disciples got all shook up and fearful. Where was the Lord? down below sleeping. Do you think that boat would have ever sunk? Never. Not as long as he was there. But see, the disciples, again, didn't know that. They, they didn't have faith enough to realize that. But always remember, that, that little boat would have never sunk. And the same way back here with the ark, with, and it was 
God the Son, whoever was implied in God back here as being part and parcel of anything to do with mankind. Remember, I showed you that back in Genesis chapter 4. And so God the Son invites Noah now to come into the ark. And he becomes the gyroscope. He's the stabilizing power that's going to hold this little old box throughout all the terrible days of that flood. Now verse 2. He said, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by not twos, but what? Sevens. Now it's kind of interesting that way back here in Genesis we are made aware of clean beasts. But we don't know what they are until we get to the law of Moses, and there it's stipulated that a clean beast is something that has the split hoof, has the two stomachs, and so on and so forth, and anything that didn't have those qualifications could not be used sacrificially. Now the clean beasts back here were the same, same kind of beasts, and I think there were only supposed to be ten of those types of beasts, if I remember correctly, and... Uh, they were to bring seven of them. Yeah, Exodus lists ten of those clean beasts, and they were to bring seventy. So seventy animals were brought on board the ark to be used later for what? Sacrifice. And so there had to be more than two, otherwise if they sacrificed one, they would have stopped the genealogy of that species. So now they bring seven of the sacrificial species so that they'll have plenty to sacrifice and still leave the pairs to perpetuate that particular species. So they were bringing the male and the female, and reading on in verse 2, of beasts that are not clean, they were to come in by twos, the male and the female. Verse 3, of fowls also of the air, by sevens, because they're going to use these for sacrifice, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Now verse 4, for yet seven days, now remember, everything is all ready. Everything is in the ark. The animals are in, the birds are in, the provender is in, Noah is in, and the Lord is there. But he says what? I'm going to wait seven days. What is this seven days? Seven days of grace. What's God giving the human race an opportunity to do? Oh, they can still come into the ark. The door is open. Everything is ready now for the cataclysmic judgment to fall. But God says, I'm going to give them seven more days. I know too many people think of God as somebody up there who, just some kind of an augury that's just waiting to just zap people. Even a lot of well-meaning religious people are scared to death that if they don't do everything just exactly perfect, that God just waiting for a chance to zap them. That's not God at all. God is the God of mercy and of grace. And even in this horrible society of Noah's day, what does God want? Oh, he wants people to still come in there. There would have been room. There would have been food enough. But how many came? Not a one. Not a one. But the door stood open with a gangplank down, if you want to picture it that way, for seven days. For seven yet days in verse 4. And then God says, I'm going to cause it to rain upon the earth. Forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made I will destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Now verse 6, we come to some chronology. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Now I'll just use a little simple arithmetic. Adam lived 930 years. The flood came at about 1600 after Adam was created. But now here Noah comes on the scene, goes into the ark, and he is already 600 years old. So how far removed from Adam is Noah? Hardly any at all. So you see, all the way up through this period of time, there has always been a godly testimony. They were never without a testimony of who God really was. And then the amazing thing is, when we come out of the, the ark after the flood, Noah lives within just a few years of Abraham. 
Probably not quite up until, but awfully close. And then that doesn't even take into consideration the three sons of Noah who were much, much younger. So always remember that as you come up through the Old Testament, and uh, there are a lot of good uh, chronological maps available. Just go to a good Christian bookstore, and I've had people give me a couple over the years, and uh, I've got them hanging in, in my office door. And you can just follow the genealogy down and see all these people overlap. Adam lives long beyond Seth, and Seth lives beyond so-and-so, and, and so on down the line, so that there were always godly men on the scene. They, they were never left without a testimony. So Noah, 600 years old when he goes into the ark. Verse 7, he went in, his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Now, I've got a question that I haven't been able to answer myself, and I certainly don't think anyone else is able to. No doubt we have to feel that Noah's three sons and their wives must have been believers. And yet, when you see what happens to them after the flood, what are we prone to wonder? Were they? I don't know. On the basis of their going into the ark, we have to believe that they were. But, oh, my land, they were mighty poor testimonies on the other side. Because just as soon as civilization takes off again from those six young people, from those three sons and their wives, what direction do they go spiritually? Down. But whatever. Uh, I can't give you the answer to it. All I know is that Noah was a righteous man. His sons and their wives were into the ark with him. Their spiritual condition, I'm in no position to guarantee one way or the other. So then we'll bring it up with just a half minute or so that we've got left, up to the time that the flood is going to break loose. I was hoping we'd get into that in this session, but it's going to have to wait for the next one now. And the flood I'm going to show you was something totally, totally different than most people think. It was not just a rain. It was a cataclysmic event, so ferocious that most people can't comprehend it. Well, we'll have to pick that up the next time because our time is gone. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.